All right, let's get started on our last theoretical framework, feminist frameworks and gender. Stop and think about what words you associate with feminism, positive words, negative words, neutral words. And the point of this activity is to illustrate that although the term feminist is controversial in our overall society, it really isn't actually controversial in the field of family studies anymore. It was when it emerged in the early 80s, maybe even into the 90s, but now it's a, an established framework from which to view the family. So those of you who have learned about feminism elsewhere, you might recognize that some of these assumptions are, seem to be more like first and second wave feminism, and we'll talk about third wave, wave feminism in an upcoming slide. So the first assumption, gender structures all societies. You know, we like our categories, um, not just in gender, but in, in many aspects of life. And so even though we're allowing gender to be more fluid than in the past, you know, many people still have a tendency to want people to choose um, a gender, or you may feel pressure to choose a gender and then identify yourselves. And the way uh, gender structures, everything for, can be seen, for example, with current transgender and um, gender non-binary uh, experiences and you know struggles over which bathroom people are allowed to use or which pronouns to use. The next uh, two assumptions, women are subordinated and the family is an institution for kind of perpetuating that. So the assumptions of feminist theory are that in general, women have had less power historically and that families, while wonderful, often perpetuate this. So for example, in a heterosexual family in which the husband works full time and the wife works part time and stays home taking care of children, if that couple is to divorce, the man's income continues to rise um, with his worker status and the woman's income really declines because we don't, as we'll see, place a premium value on care work. Um, Another assumption is about feminism is that it's emancipatory. This means that feminism emphasizes social change. Um, the other theories that we have studied just simply to describe, simply tried to describe families and feminism is different in that it tries to um, say equality is the ideal. We should we should have social change. And then the last one is, you know, the family is not monolithic. That just means that. Oh, there's varying forms of families and not all families are that SNAF or standard North American family that we've talked about. Okay, so there's obviously lots of intellectual traditions for feminist theory which developed elsewhere before it came into the field of family studies. And I'll just highlight a few of them. So Mary Wollstonecraft, she was writing at the end of the 1700s and she said, for example, that women failed to develop their minds because their only avenue of, of obtaining power was through marriage. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, um, she had this interesting proposal that the services that women provided, and she was writing right around 1900, um, so the services women provided, a cook, nutritionist, childcare, cleaning, these should be paid professions offered at the community level rather than the family level. That woman, one woman would cook for her entire neighborhood, one woman would provide the childcare for her, for her block, one woman would clean for multiple families, basically as a way of elevating women's work and tying some money to it. Um, you may know Char Charlotte Perkins Gilman's name from <clears throat> a short story in, in an American literature class in high school called The Yellow Wallpaper. This was about a woman experiencing postpartum depression that her husband, who was a doctor, required that she bed, be on bed rest in her room and wouldn't, you know, wouldn't let her leave. And eventually she went insane, kind of crawling around the edges of her room. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, interestingly, also wrote a book called Herland, which was um, about a female utopia where no men lived. So there's that kind of male bashing part of feminism, right? Okay, so um, the anthropologist Margaret Mead, she argued um, that gendered behaviors were cultural and not genetic, and she studied societies in which females were, for example, more aggressive and males were more nurturing. And then Betty Friedan, um, feminine mystique. So Friedan really challenged the notions that the American dream um, of the nuclear family in the suburbs was in the 1950s was the best thing. And so she coined that phrase, the problem with no name, and also mother's little helper, 
uh, which referred to Valium in the 1950s that women took to try to kind of keep them happy. So obviously, you know, many women in the 1950s maybe were happy with their roles, but there were a lot of women who weren't. And as we'll see when we get into historical context and read uh, Stephanie Kuntz, rates of anxiety and depression were pretty high for women in the 1950s. As you may have learned elsewhere, feminist theory distinguishes between sex, which is your biology, and gender or gender roles, which is the meaning or the attitude or the behavior. And gender roles, according to feminist theory, is are created uh, via an interactional process between individuals and society, also referred to here as the institution. So think about the father role and how that's changed. You know, 20 years ago, I had friends who would push a stroller down a street and would stop and be complimented for what an amazing father they were. We don't see that quite so much anymore, at least not here in the United States, um, because men are taking on more of the daily tasks of caring for kids. So we've had a lot of men at the individual level create change, which then changes what it means to be a dad at the societal or institutional level, which then reciprocally changes what men do at the individual level. Sexism occurs when sex is seen as basically genetically determined or immutable, unchangeable, and also kind of harmful or damaging attributions are made about all men or women. Even if these sound kind of positive, like all women are nurturing, that's still damaging, right? And obviously something like all men are aggressive is as well. Um, power and privilege. So going back to those first, second, third waves of feminism, the first wave of feminism was really about getting women the right to vote. The second wave was more about women's rights. Both of these movements were really geared towards white women. It was considered kind of a white women's movement until the third wave of feminism. And the third wave of feminism emerged in the 1990s and really went beyond gender to look at all forms of oppression, uh, according to class, race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, physical ability, religion. Um, and so now feminists are really seeking to empower those with less power. And then uh, that leads to that concept of intersectionality, um, which we'll see more about coming as we go and in, move into contexts around race and ethnicity and LGBTQ. Um, that we can, people can be marginalized in multiple ways, not just one. Um, and then lastly, concepts of family, household, and care work. Uh, feminist theory has always focused on those, kind of like those assumptions that the family is a, a way that women have been subordinated. So the more we um, make women's work about care work and then we don't assign money to it, we devalue it, then we, um, you know, kind of perpetuate uh, lack of power for women. And, and certainly still, um, you know, those of you who are HDFS majors, you know, we don't pay that much for care work. It's often unpaid or lower paid. We tend to pay a lot more money for taking care of things than we do people. Feminist theory also tries to highlight and deconstruct the ideology of separate spheres, also kind of known as the concepts of public and private spheres. So prior to the Industrial Revolution, we didn't have so much of a sense that women should be responsible for the home and men should be responsible for work outside the home. But once we had the Industrial Revolution, some people had to go to work in factories and some people had to stay home. And so we really created an ideology that it should be men leaving the home and women staying at home. And that became kind of our gender socialization. Um, and we still, to some extent, operate on that, that men should be ideal workers and women should have primary responsibility for house and child care. Even if we don't necessarily believe that, we can often feel those expectations kind of come down on our shoulders if we become, you know, mothers or fathers. Um, and then this all led to, uh, the, you know, men as, as breadwinners um, and maybe even men as the sole economic provider. That really was ever attainable for mostly upper and middle class families, um, except during some of the kind of early and mid 1900s where we really had this sense that a man should be able to earn a family wage. And so then fatherhood really became kind of um, associated with breadwinning, whereas prior to the industrial revolution and the public private spheres, fatherhood was more about morality or discipline and not so much about financially providing. So now we're going to talk about a couple of different versions of feminism, liberal feminism and cultural feminism. 
And you may, for example, identify as a feminist and read something that's written by a feminist that you disagree with because it's from the another camp of feminism. Um, so this kind of helps clarify that you might agree with some aspects of feminism, but not others. Okay, so liberal feminism and gender theory, um, these would technically be slightly different, but they're very similar. Uh, gender theory grew out of liberal feminism, and so I'm going to lump them together. So um, liberal feminism and gender theory uh, basically minimize the innate or biological differences between sexes. They see males and females as inherently more similar, and gender difference is really socially constructed. Um, and, and just as an aside, if you're doing your theory paper on feminist theory, you might try searching for gender theory sometimes, or if you see gender theory, that tells you that you're using a, a you know, liberal feminism. Okay, so that idea of um, uh, doing gender, right? It was a this was a famous phrase coined by Weston Zimmerman in the 1980s that we often kind of, based on kind of what society tells us, that institutional gender, we do it at the individual level. Um, and so, for example, I remember one morning I was on a weekend, I was making my kids breakfast. I was making them pancakes and bacon and a fruit shake. And I was so impressed that I with myself for having made them three things. And so when they sat down at the counter to eat, I pronounced, I made you three things, pancakes, bacon, and a fruit shake. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm an amazing mother. And they in chorus said, you're as good as daddy, right? So that was funny here. I thought I was doing gender, but my husband was actually doing the mother role in some ways better. Um, okay, so meaning versus behavior. Oh, gender as dynamic. That just means that um, it's changing, right? So our gendered roles or our views about males, females, mothers, fathers, boys, girls, whatever, um, binary gender, like all that can be shifting and changing over time. It's not necessarily static. So originally the conceptualization around sex roles was this idea that we would in childhood develop a sense of masculinity or femininity or a combination of both and we would carry that through our lives. But in reality, people's uh, gender identity and roles really shift. Okay, so meaning and behavior. In a time of social transition, basically some aspects of um, a couple, for example, gender roles may change at a different pace um, in than others. So they could have an incongruence between their attitude and, the be and their behavior, either at the individual level or at the couple level. So for example, maybe I'm a man who believes that I should be the breadwinner, but the my wife is earning more than me. Um, and having that inconsistency between kind of what's my actual behavior and my attitude can, can be associated with less individual or, for example, relationship well-being. However, oftentimes our attitudes can change once our situation has changed. Situation, research says, is pretty powerful. So a laid off father who takes care of his children more than he expected might come to change the meaning that he makes around his father role. A woman, woman earning a high salary might change her own constructions of being a breadwinner. So that further kind of illustrates that idea of gender as dynamic. In, so here's an example of how meaning and behavior um, can be different and how feminism might attend to both of these concepts. So in heterosexual couples, wives on average spend more time than husbands on, in, on household labor and childcare. That gap is narrowing. Um, women, men are doing slightly more and women are doing a lot less. They're either hiring it out or letting it go. Um, but what matters more than the actual hours for uh, relationship satisfaction is wives' perceptions of fairness. Um, so it doesn't actually matter you know, how equal it is in terms of time. It matters how she believes it, it is fair in term, in kind of that's a bigger predictor of relationship satisfaction. So her perception may, may be based on what she witnessed growing up. Um, or maybe she's comparing herself to her friends. Her, she is comparing herself and her husband to her friends and their husbands. Or maybe she's been married before and her current husband is doing a lot more. And so she perceives it's fair. Oh, okay, so cultural feminism is similar to liberal feminism in that it also wants, you know, equality for males and females and empowerment of women. But cultural feminism goes at this a slightly different way. It, it is more likely to highlight differences between men and women 
um, and sees those as what are called essential or innate um, differences. So this idea that maybe there's some essential female traits as being more peaceful or more nurturing or more emotionally expressive. And so cultural feminism would say, it's not our differences that are the problem, but instead it's how we value um, differences. And so for example, nurturing and caring should be valued as much as being strong and brave or emotion should be valued as much as intellect. Um, and so we need to give equal value to both kind of innate or inherent female and male qualities. And cultural feminism would also be more likely to advocate for special treatment for women based on like having less strength or more responsibility for, or, you know, sole responsibility for childbearing. Um, some, you know, older examples of this, if, if you run across ever um, in terms of discussions of morality, Carol, Carol Gilligan in a different voice, she was theorizing that women um, uh, had an ethic of care and men had an ethic of justice. That would be an example of cultural feminism, a, a difference in how um, men and women kind of made moral decisions. Rachel Hare Mustin is on the picture is in the picture on the left with a former professor of mine. She's a psychologist, retired now, academic. Um, and she developed this very famous concept of alpha bias and beta bias, which has been used to describe gender. And it's also been used with sexual orientation and race and ethnicity. And she made up these terms, alpha and beta bias, from the errors that we can make in hypothesis testing, alpha error and beta error, which you may have learned about in a statistics class. And so alpha error is the probability that you will say there's a difference between these two populations that doesn't actually exist. And beta error is the likelihood that you'll show no difference between these populations when in fact one actually does exist. So applied to gender, alpha bias is exaggerating differences between males and females that don't exist. And beta bias is making them sound more similar that they, than they are maybe in terms of power and privilege and ignoring differences. And so our goal is to try to stay in the middle and avoid either extreme. In class, we stand and put ourselves on this continuum and talk about why we are where we are in terms of emphasizing differences between men and women, males and females, or emphasizing similarities, um, and whether or not we see differences as biological, socially constructed, or some of both. And I also make the point that we will throughout our lives move around on this continuum, as I have myself, sometimes emphasizing more difference, sometimes emphasizing more similarity. The next few slides are going to illustrate how we tend to exaggerate difference in our society, particularly in the media, and even researchers tend to look for gender difference. So my son was really into uh, gross motor skills and balls as a kid, and so sometimes people would say something like, oh, he's all boy, or he's such a boy, yet at the same time, they kind of seemed to miss that his favorite color was magenta, that he was pretty emotional. Um, and so we tend to look for the ways that people um, meet our conceptualization of gender differences and miss the ways that maybe males and females are more similar. So um, as I mentioned, we are we have a tendency to overfocus on gender difference and ignore gender similarity in our society. So in the media, you're more likely to see headlines, you know, like boys and girls are different on, you know, math. Um, you're not as likely to see a big headline that says, surprise, males and females are more similar on this. Um, so researchers also tend to do this. They tend to look for gender differences. And if they don't find it, if males and females are more similar, you know, in some they don't even write that up as something interesting. Similarity somehow isn't interesting. I've read a lot of textbooks on child development and there's oftentimes a section on gender difference, but it doesn't say gender similarity and difference. And it doesn't say something like most of the things we've talked about in this chapter, you know, boys and girls are similar, but here's a few differences. So on the next slides, I'll be presenting evidence to basically counter our overfocus on difference and provide some evidence for gender similarity. And a lot of this is drawn from Janet Shibley Hyde and her gender similarity hypothesis. So this first idea is that 
we have to distinguish between statistical significance versus the magnitude of difference. And maybe you've learned about this in statistics or research methods class. And so uh, an example of this would be a thousand people take a math test. And let's say that men on average get an 80% and women get a 78.5%. If you have a thousand people, that's a statistically significant difference, but it doesn't really tell us how big of a difference it actually is. So we need to know the magnitude of difference. That tells us how big and how much we need to care. And so Cohen's D is one of the more common measures of effect size. It's the difference between two means divided by the standard deviations. Um, and now APA is really recommending that people don't just say, oh, we have statistical significance, but they also give some estimate of effect size in their results. Um, so then the last uh, points that you're going to see as we go through these next few slides is that there's extensive variation um, between males and females and also overlapping distributions of whatever it is that we're talking about. So not all men fall into one category um, and, and vice versa with women. So for example, even though men are on average more aggressive than women, lots of men aren't aggressive and some women are more aggressive than some men. So you'll see this kind of point made as we walk through um, uh, areas of gender difference and what the magnitude is in each of these. When we hear about gender difference in the media, sometimes we can imagine that to be a lot bigger than it is. And we can imagine that it's almost like all men do better on math tests than all women, which is hardly the case. Um, and the next graphs will make that more clear. You may have heard that men perform better on math tests than women do. And on standardized tests, uh, that is a statistically significant difference in some studies. And you can see that reflected in this graph here, that the men are slightly higher than the women. But statistical significance is different than the magnitude of difference. It doesn't tell you how big of a difference it is. It just tells you that there is one, even if it's tiny. And what this graph shows us is that the curves really overlap. Men on average in some studies are only slightly better uh, with an average score than women are. And what you can see from these overlapping curves is there's still quite a few women better at math SAT scores than a lot of men. This graph just shows us that women uh, on average have a slight um, advantage when it comes to uh, math classes, basically like your grade at the end of the semester, maybe in high school or in college. And um, women on average are doing currently better than men in college. But you can see that that's a really small difference. It's, and there's still lots of men doing better than lots of women. Cohen's D is a, a statistic used to measure the difference between groups to tell us how big it is. And differences that are considered very small or non-existent have a D statistic between 0 and 0 0.10. And Janet Shipley Hyde is famous for having done several meta-analyses over the years of reviewing all the research that's been done on gender similarities and differences and trying to give us a sense of how big or small those are. And so we're going to talk that through in a series of slides starting with no differences, then moving to small differences, moderate differences, and large gender differences. And so what you can see here is that um, many things that we imagine might have um, gender difference are actually small and, and maybe hardly at all, including math, um, vocabulary, reading comprehension, essay writing, um, even things like negative affect, um, attitudes towards affairs, attitudes towards masturbation, attitudes towards oral sex, or attitudes towards lesbians. So in a lot of ways, we're not seeing any differences between males and females. And in Janet's Shibley Hyde's studies, um, about 81% of the effects were either no difference or uh, small gender difference. So this slide shows us a series of, in, the, in her meta-analyses, small gender differences and kind of 
who was more likely to show slightly higher levels. And the graph there shows you what a small gender difference looks like. It, it's basically what we saw for some studies in terms of math. Um, and so we uh, can see that um, women show some areas where they show more, men show some areas where they show slightly more. But again, this is on average, and there's a lot of variation between males and females. So some gender differences are more in the middle, are moderate, in between small and big. And you can see that what the distribution looks like there in terms of two overlapping distributions with, on average, um, for example, um, males maybe, and I think for all these, it's males having slightly more than females. Um, but again, there's a lot of variation. Some men are really low, some men are really high, most are in the middle. And there's still women who can have more assertiveness, more aggression, better spatial abilities, more frequency of masturbation or pornography, or um, more open attitudes towards casual sex than men. In Hyde's meta-analysis, and this has been echoed in other research, recent research as well, the only two areas where we're seeing larger gender differences is that we see <clears throat> women as more focused on people um, maybe in their hobbies and in their careers, and men on average as being more focused on things in their hobbies and their careers. And we can see this, for example, in how women are more in the care work service sector and men might be more in STEM fields. And when women have um, moved into a lot of different careers over the last several decades, they've tended to move into careers that involve people or animals more so than things. Um, but that's just a average and you can see that there's still women who are more focused on for example things than some men also women on average show more tender-mindedness which might be related to kind of empathy um, so those are the two that show up so when you hear about differences in the media you want to be thinking about how big of a difference is it actually I read this in the Sunday morning newspaper a number of years ago I'd like so this is an old study. There's no chance you'd find it in your searching for articles in the last 10 years, but you can see even from the title that it was using gender theory, um, which is again, that kind of outgrowth of the feminist, or sorry, liberal feminism. Okay, so just an overview of the study is the very first section. It was studying wives, heterosexual couples, wives' attitudes towards breadwinning. And basically that their, how they constructed their ideology or their attitudes about their own breadwinning could range, I think in six or eight dimensions from either being what she called an employed homemaker, um, meaning working, but thinking of herself as a homemaker to a woman who was thinking of herself as a co-breadwinner because in this study, all the men were also working. Um, and her findings um, supported the, her hypothesis that wives orientation towards breadwinning was more predicted by current situational factors like how much money her husband was earning or how much money she was getting paid than with her own childhood socialization around gender. In the second section, overview of the theory, you just want to summarize the feminist theory using what you've heard in this lecture and Smith and Hammond. So the author, um, used several theoretical propositions based on gender theory and kind of related concepts. So gender is always being constructed and socially constructed. It's dynamic. Um, attitudes and behaviors can be incongruent. So those examples around breadwinning and using kind of a, an assumption of gender theory, basically current situational variables should be better predictors of wives' orientation towards breadwinning than historical variables around kind of um, gender socialization growing up, which the latter is more congruent with sex role theory. And then in terms of my critical evaluation, I would say, wow, she did an amazing job contrasting sexual theory and gender theory. She also described gender theory in general and specifically related to breadwinning. In her measures section, she had measures that were tied to sexual theory and gender theory, so she could test them both. 
she clearly interpreted her results in terms of gender theory. And then because we now require you to make a suggestion, you'd have to find something. And even if they did overall a good job, maybe she could have more clearly described what it means that gender is dynamic or something like that. In the fifth section, we apply a different theory that we study. So let's say I would apply family systems theory, and maybe, and I would think we ask you to summarize four concepts or assumptions. So here's a couple of them there. Maybe I talk about interdependence and circular causality. And then we ask you to interpret the results from a feminist or from a family systems theory perspective in this case, um, if that's the one you chose. And so I would say, wow, if I look at these results and I had a family systems hat on, I would say wives, breadwinning um, behaviors and attitudes are interdependent with husbands, breadwinning and attitudes that you can't really understand wives, breadwinning and attitudes until you know what's happening also with husbands. And then I would also hypothesize that if husbands and wives disagree, um, regarding their attitudes towards breadwinning, there would be increased conflict in the couple subsystem.